Welcome back to the 181st episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex. And today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including the Toyota plants increasing their average pay after the unions won their strike, how the Bidens pushing for the EV evolution may actually not work out for some of the big dealers, and a interesting story talking about Glenn Youngkin and how he turned around Virginia in the major election coming up. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling from me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So will the UAW's, I mean, I, w- I don't want to say record-breaking, but their huge deal that they've made with all three of the major automakers, are they going to affect other companies? I mean, we've already seen it with Toyota, but are they going to be able to actually say to those workers, hey, look what we did here. Look at this big, big impact that we had at these three automakers. And actually, are they going to be able to start making inroads into some of these other companies and start unionizing them? There's been lots of resistance for a long time. And as we will learn in this first article, Toyota is doing what it can to make sure it doesn't happen. But I think that Sean Fain really wants to do it. I think he's going to be, I don't want to say militant about it, but he's definitely going to push hard in order to get into them. And do you think he'll be successful? That's my question today. If there's another angle to it that I don't see or someone else doesn't see, throw it into the comment section. I'd love to hear what everybody has to say. All right, let's jump into our first article that comes from Truth Out. Toyota gives workers a raise days after UAW reveals historic deal with Big Three. So, as I highlighted in the daily debate, yep, Toyota's looking at this deal and they are saying, oh, no, 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 we are not losing workers to any of those plants and we are also not going to give them any reason to go and leave us or unionize. So, they're kind of feeling the pressure right now or at least that's how that, I mean, the headline, that's how they want to frame it and I wouldn't necessarily disagree. It's supply and demand. If the prices or the wages at another plant are better and you're not getting paid enough by that same standard or you get paid less than those other people, you might want to go over there or you might want to unionize in order to ensure that you can get the same sort of deal-making process that those UAW union workers did. And maybe there's a few of the employees who are just totally against unions and on principle alone they won't join, but sorry, that. That's not how most people work. They need to feed their kids. They need to pay their house. They need to pay for insurance. So now they're they're probably going to look at those other wages and say, ooh, I want that. So let's jump into a, one quote that comes directly from the first paragraph. Quote, days after the United Auto Workers announced tentative deals with the big three car makers, Toyota confirmed this week that it would offer raises to its non-union U.S. factory workers. The Japanese automaker said Wednesday that hourly manufacturers at the top of the pay scale would see a 9% raise beginning January 1st, Reuters reported. UAW President Sean Fain, who is attempting to use the union's victory to bolster the wider labor movement, said that the timing of Toyota's announcement was no coincidence. Quote, Toyota isn't giving out raises out of the goodness of their heart, he said in a video statement shared by More Perfect Union on Friday. Quote, Toyota is the largest and most profitable auto company in the world. They could have just as easily raised wages a month ago or a year ago. They did it now because the company knows we're coming for them, end quote. So it's, it's pretty obvious at this point that Sean Fain, he is gunning for him. He wants to make sure that his movement is bolstered. He was brought in by the members, the members of the union, after a whole series of deals and contracts with the old leadership <laughs> that didn't actually help the people too much or were, you know, kind of concessionary, like, oh, they got a little bit of a pay raise, but they ended up helping the big three a little bit more. That's how it's framed, and that's how some union members see it. And now... Sean Fain, brought in by the people, he's like, okay, we're going to make our ranks bigger. And you may be thinking, well, okay, why, why does that matter? If he makes his ranks bigger, if he makes the power of his union larger because of the amount of workers from a whole bunch of different uh, auto manufacturers, a whole bunch of different factories, it allows him to negotiate 
a better contract for everybody. It allows him to exert more power when they go on a strike. So you can see why it's enticing for him as the leader to not only say he's going to go after Toyota, but actually go after Toyota. And also, it's something that he can sell to his members who, you know, they may not love every single part of the deal that they got with the big three. They're probably going to like a lot of it. And they'll probably approve it because it's stuff that they haven't gotten before. But if it's not exactly what they wanted, he's going to throw out this next cherry, which is, hey, we're going to go after these other automakers that are undercutting some of the prices in our market because, you know, Ford, GM, uh, they still have to be competitive with Toyota. So at the end of the day, they can't just start offering way too high wages because otherwise Toyota will eat their lunch on the price of the car. So you can see here how expanding the union, getting more members in there from these plants of the other manufacturers, including Tesla, including Toyota, including Honda, Nissan, all of these companies, the more that they can get underneath that umbrella, the larger collective power that they have in order to affect change in the entire manufacturing, uh, how should I say, industry here in the United States. So what is that expanding going to look like, or how is it outlaid here in the article? Quote, in the deals struck with Ford, Stellantis, and General Motors, the UAW secured a 15% pay raise over the life of the contracts. The tentative agreement brought it to an end, a historic six-week strike, as members return to work while, they're, while they vote on whether or not to ratify the deals. The UAW has negotiated for the three contacts to expire on April 30th, 2028 a slightly longer lifespan than usual, according to labor notes. In a speech Sunday, Fain said part of the reason for this longer contract was to give a labor movement time to build towards a potential strike on May Day 2028. Fain also said the UAW planned to spend the next four and a half years organizing workers at non-union plants owned by companies including Tesla, Volkswagen, Mercedes, BMW, Honda, Nissan, Toyota, end quote. And yeah, I guess I only listed, you know, Tesla and then some of the more uh, Asiatic countries, companies, instead of also listing the German ones, which is interesting because the, the labor movement in Germany was pretty darn strong. And the fact that they have plants here that aren't unionized, I mean, it's probably why they came here, because the plants weren't unionized or as unionized as the ones in Germany. But, you know, I found that just a little, little bit interesting. But you can see that he is shooting for the stars here. And also, it's very strategic that his strike ends on the 30th of April, 2028. And he's even called for everybody to end their strikes. Any other labor movement, whether it be in a, a totally different industry like Amazon or even Starbucks, he's trying to ask them to coordinate all of their contracts ending around that time so they can all go out on a general strike, not just a strike in one industry or another. And I don't want to say bring the country to its knees, but definitely show the true power of unions, which, I mean, if you hear that as a executive at any of these companies, you're going to be terrified. You're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. Now unions are they're organizing across industries. They're not just organizing within our own industry. So it's not just that, oh, maybe we could replace a few members at our end of things, at our uh, Amazon packaging facilities is to know there's going to be strikes up and down the supply chain, which is going to make everything extremely painful. So you can see why this is really important to Fain and why he's probably going to push to get into some of these other striking, oh, sorry, these other manufacturers, you know, in the auto industry that are not American made, try to get a strong presence there before 2028. And then he can have a general strike. He can try to plan a general strike with some of the other unions in order to really show America, the American government, as well as the companies, what a union is capable of. And when doing this, guess what? He's going to label himself. He is going to be the union dad for the next 50 years. If he's able to pull off a general strike that affects supply cha chains up and down, and there aren't many companies that can get away with not being involved in it, that's why he's trying to expand to BMW, Honda, Nissan, Toyota, so that the amount of companies that aren't affected by it, the amount of companies that actually kind of get to live happy when the strike's going on is lowered. He is going to be seen as, along with whoever else joins him, one of the greatest labor leaders of our generation. And 
if he can pull it off, which I'm saying it's a big if, if he can pull it off, uh, I think he's probably going to stay at the UAW for quite some time. So it may be a, you know, a populism play trying to really invigorate things, or it could be that he, he is so genuinely in on the idea of unions, the power that they hold, and he really, really does want to affect such large change that this is how he thinks he can go about doing it. I don't know which one it is. I don't know if Mr. Fane is a vain man and wants to be, or a prideful man and wants to be seen as the man who saved the union movement or, movement or whatever, or if he just genuinely wants to do it because he cares about the people. I, I have no idea. I have a suspicion that it's a little bit of both, but at the end of the day, he seems to talk in a fashion that he just cares about the union movement. So we'll see where that one goes from there. Now, there's a little bit of background in this article about the Toyota workers, so I, I kind of want to read that so we walk away actually with an idea of what this article is about rather than me just ranting about the future of union power. Quote, on Monday, a Toyota employee at the plant in Alabama told Labor Notes that the management had called workers into emergency meeting offering a raise in top pay to $32 an hour and scale up workers to that level in four years instead of eight. Another employee at a Kentucky plant said the top rate for production workers there had been raised to two dollars and ninety, raised by two dollars and ninety four cents to thirty four eighty, and skilled trade workers saw a three dollar and seventy percent boost to forty three point thirty three dollars and twenty cents. Toyota confirmed it was offering raises to news outlets on Wednesday. It also said it was having the time needed to reach top pay across the board and expanding paid time off. We value our employees and their contributions, and we show it by offering robust compensation packages that we continually renew and ensure that we remain competitive with automotive industries. Chris Reynolds, Toyota Motor North America's executive vice president, said in a statement reported to Reuters. So, uh, well, yeah, may maybe it's not just about, oh, yes, we constantly review, we want to stay competitive, but we don't want to lose our people. But I guess that's what he means by staying competitive. It's not like he's really hiding the ball here. He's pretty out and open with it, just using a little bit more corporate language. And, you know, who can blame him, especially with the unions knocking on his door. So I want to jump into our next article that talks about one of the major three automakers that we were discussing a little bit ago, GM. And it's an article about how their EV battle, their battle to become an EV creator, has not necessarily gone the way that some people would like, especially in the Biden administration. This article comes from the Washington Times. Electric car drives flame out. Biden's bribes still can't move EVs. So if you know what the title is, you know we've also discussed some of this kind of stuff before, which is the Biden subsidies and really pushing for electric cars isn't necessarily working out the way that he would have liked. So this article is trying to do another deep dive and they're trying to say, okay, is this EV revolution, is this push for EVs going to really work out for them? And if you look at Tesla, Tesla has, over the course of, what, it is 2023 at the point of recording this, and they were started in about 2003, if I'm not mistaken, but they actually got a car ready and going by, like, 2008, and then mass production came in for the Model S by, like, 2011. So they've been, you know, really rolling for 12 years. They've existed for 20 and they've had all that time to really refine their processes and make it actually affordable to mass-produce an electric car. These other traditional automakers like GM, Ford, Stellantis, you know, BMW, they haven't all gotten there quite yet. And they're being pushed that direction by Biden, who's giving subsidies to companies for making electric cars or even subsidies to the entire electric car industry, subsidies to people for buying electric cars. You can tell that under Biden and even under President Obama, this was a big push. This was something that they cared about. But is it actually working out? Are these automakers that aren't Tesla that are trying to tailor for a new uh, EV supply chain, a new EV market, are they actually winning out? And is that market robust enough to even allow for all these companies to start producing EVs and actually make a dent into the market? Quote, 
the last thing consumers want during a lifetime of soaring interest rates and high sky high inflation is an expensive fashion statement. Electric cars are primarily marketed to individuals anxious that others know they care so deeply about the planet and that they're willing to accept the trade-offs that come with owning an electric vehicle. The vast majority of drivers, however, aren't interested in trading in a five-minute stop for gas for an hours-long roadside charging session. No wonder General Motors CEO Mara Barra told investors last week she was delaying the launch of the new big models like the Chevrolet Equinox EV, the Silverado EV RST, the GMC Sierra EV Denali. GM also retracted previously proclaimed projection targets as overly optimistic. Quote, we are not providing new targets, explained GM Chief Financial Officer Paul Jacobson. Quote, but we are moving to a more agile approach to continually evaluate EV demand as a clever way of pretending that making 2,400 electric Cadillac Lakes uh, SUVs instead of the 25,000 that have been forecast is still part of the strategy, end quote. So yes, of course, there Oh, we are going to make sure that we are aware of the dynamic demand changes of a very uh, new and growing industry, and we want to ensure that we can provide the customer with the best product without necessarily um, throwing money in the trash. Is what they're saying. Come on, like this is this is such this is such corporate talk. The last one where the Toyota oh, <laughs> the Toyota North America vice president came out and was like. Oh yeah, we want to make sure our wages are competitive. Like he was not really hiding the ball. This guy is definitely hiding the ball here at GM. He is he's basically like, "Oh yeah, we're not going to provide new targets because we don't know what the market needs." Which is basically saying, "We don't even know if the market will be around in the future. We don't know if this investment will actually be worth it, and we also don't know if we could even make a projection and keep up with it." So yeah, let's just not do that. It it is kind of hilarious. And though the author is very snarky and try to be very clever. I do kind of agree with the sentiment here, which is it's corporate nothing talk at the end of the day. And it's sad to see when the Biden administration and when this industry overall has been heavily subsidized, when they have been given, uh, I don't want to just say loans, because they have been giving loans by the Department of Energy, but they've also been giving straight price cuts or uh, different tax remittances. When it's, it's so interesting when the government really wants something to happen they go full hog on it they allow for loans from some of their major departments they also say oh you'll get a little bit of a tax break here and then they're trying to push them in the way towards evs and even gm who is one of the largest car manufacturers which has a lot of resources to deploy towards this agenda they have a lot of resources that they could throw behind this a lot of weight and yet they still can't, with all of the extra little helpings from the Biden administration, they can't actually get behind it and make it really, really efficient yet. They're still losing a lot of money on each car that they are putting out there. So obviously something's wrong here. That means that the demand isn't there or the processes in the company isn't quite there yet. And guess what? If the demand's not there, why would they naturally create the processes in the company in order to create these cars? So... You're like, wait, hold on, Alex, what do you mean? So if I am a lollipop manufacturer and I love giving out some candied uh, apple lollipops, I don't know why I said candied apple, but maybe that's a flavor that people really, really enjoy. And I'm like, okay, I, I can keep producing the candy that I know is flying off my shelves, or I can you know, experiment with another type of candy that I was told by... Uh, my largest loan giver, the person that gives me the most money in order to operate the company, well, he really wants a cotton candy lollipop. And I test it out in the store, and only, you know, maybe 10% of the people that normally come in really like the cotton candy lollipop, lollipop, but the biggest funder, he really loves that one. So I put in all the time and effort into getting the candy, can, cotton candy lollipop just right. I do all the investment and I still can't get them to fly off the shelves. I'm still not making money off of them yet because I haven't gotten all the efficiencies down. But oh no, well, my, my largest loan giver, he's happy at least. So it's this sort of thing where they're caught between, oh, well, we like the money that's coming from the government on this one. We like that we're able to get a few tax breaks here or there. 
But at the same time, the demand's not quite there. So if the market was just left to itself and the government wasn't interfering, would GM actually invest that time? Would I actually invest that time in making a new flavor if it's not going to sell? No. So this is obviously the government manipulating the market. And it's not going to work out well at all. The author also points out something here with... Uh, GM and some of these other companies that are putting electric cars together, because of how the margins are so tight on these cars, they're actually starting to do something that's a little bit clever. And you may have heard about some of these before, but it's software that you pay for, like a subscription service. Because what happens with cars is they either give them out to the dealers and you buy them directly from the dealers, you have a loan, and then guess what? You're paying back the bank. You're not paying back that automaker anymore. They got their money from the bank, and you're paying back that loan. So once they sell you the car, for the most part, besides you know, service checks and things like that, they're not making recurring income from you. Well, guess what? In times When times are tough and they need recurring income, there's even the idea that software could be a subscription service. Let me just read a quick article, uh, sorry, a quick paragraph from this article. By software revenue, some electric car makers have floated the idea of turning optional equipment into recurring subscriptions. Under this dystopian business model, features like heated seats require a separate monthly payment, something nobody wants. While the tax credits are attractive, even the 7500 Uncle Sam is willing to pay the wealthy to go electric, it isn't enough to generate momentum. And that 7500 figure is just the most visible manifestation of the government's involvement in the industry. In May, for instance, state and local authorities in Indiana approved a $330 million in tax subsidies for an EV battery factory, factory planned by Ulium Cells, GM's joint venture with South Korea's LG. President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act cut a blank check to the industry with a provision known as 45X that the Congressional Budget Office estimates will transfer a stunning $30.6 billion in taxpayer cash into the pockets of EV battery makers. Industry analysts at Benchmark Source think the total battery subsidy will be closer to $150 billion. So, let, you know, what is uh, $150 billion of a trillion? Well, it's about... 15% of a trillion. How much of our budget right now are we uh, blowing on things like this when we are nearly 20, I'm pretty sure it's $23 trillion in debt. Last time I was actually paying attention and not, you know, holding my head in anger and sadness that we're going that much in debt. Why do we need to spend on this? If the market incentives are there, if there's enough demand, enough people want to go to a EV car, then the company will be able to reap the reward of the R&D and the streamlining of the supply chains and the manufacturing process, and they'll be able to make money off of it. You don't need all these government subsidies in an ideal world if the industry can thrive because of market demand. But guess what? The market demand isn't there, and the government wants to push it there. They want to put their hand on the lever, and they want to yank it towards EV cars. And as a person who wouldn't mind getting an EV car, I'll be honest, I don't like the whole charging time difference stuff. Uh, don't get me wrong. I don't like some of the inconveniences that come with electric cars, but I wouldn't mind doing it. But honestly, and, and this is just my stubborn self, when the government says, no, you will do it, when they push so hard for something, it makes me question why. It makes me skeptical. Because yes, they could say it's for environmental reasons, but we also know that cars like Tesla, that electric car, it is so, what's the word I'm looking for here? It is so intertwined with the software that's included. And that software can also monitor you inside your car to make sure for self-driving, to make sure that your hands are on the right uh, wheel. And all of these different software features could enable it to drive itself, obviously, but also enable it to be shut down remotely if someone was able to hack it. So you, you hear some of these things and you see the government pushing for some of these cars really, really hard, and you just question why. It turns off people who would be interested, who would possibly get one of these electric cars. I'm raising my hand right now. But it makes me question what their intentions are, and then I get skeptical, and I get paranoid, and I say, no, screw you. We're not doing that. We're not playing that game. 
So we'll see if the long game works out for the Biden administration and the federal government. Uh, it probably will. Let's be clear. You know, they'll just throw a sh- crap ton of money at it. But guess who's going to probably feel the most pain? It's either going to be the customer because we have EVs forced upon us eventually, or it's going to be the companies that can't necessarily uh, reap the rewards of all that effort that they've put in because, the, like I said a million times, the demand ain't there. So we'll see. All right, let's jump to our final article that comes from Newsmax. Yes, you heard me right. I, I read a Newsmax article. Um, you know, they kind of have a reputation for being one way or another, but this one seemed pretty straightforward, and I kind of enjoyed it because it's about Virginia, my previous home state. So the headline reads, Governor Glenn Youngkin to Newsmax, Virginia, a roadmap for conservatives. So for anyone who doesn't keep their eye on Virginia politics, and as someone who was in Virginia, still didn't keep the closest eye to Virginia politics, I uh, did a little bit, but not the closest eye in the world. Uh, Glenn Youngkin has completely turned around, or at least the perception is he's completely turned around the state of Virginia. He came in when it was a Democratic majority in the House of Delegates as well. I think he, along with his election, they were actually able to get the Senate. I could be wrong. It could be flipped that they don't have the Senate, but they gained the House. But they had one House of the Virginia state legislator. And now we have a crucial election coming up tomorrow. I'm recording this on Sunday. This will go live on Monday. So the election will be Tuesday, November 7th, and it will be an absolutely crucial one. And if it goes really well, then it may show what the game plan needs to be going into 2024. And I I believe I also made comments about this on Friday as we're getting closer to this next election, which is Yunkin is saying, hey, this is a blue state or, you know, it's a purple state, but it really started to drift more towards solid blue. And now Republicans are making inroads. Why is that? And can this be a guiding light for the rest of the Republican Party throughout the rest of the nation? So here's how the article begins. Quote, Virginia used to be controlled by Democrats, but GOP Governor Glenn Youngkin is hailing having flipped the state with common sense, exposing liberals for just selling fear and having no agenda and no plan. Quote, let's be clear. They don't know how to create jobs. They're damaging our economy with Bidenomics. They don't stand up for parents and schools. They diminish educational standards. They demean law enforcement. Crime goes up. They waste money. They haven't done anything for behavioral health. Youngkin told Newsmax host Tom Basil from the campaign trail Friday in an interview that aired on Saturday's America Right Now. Quote, the Democrats have no agenda. They have no plan. All they want to do is sell fear. Republicans once were woefully behind politically in the once blue state, but Youngkin hailed Virginia being the roadmap for conservatives flipping estates to their views and their values. End quote. And maybe that's true. Maybe some of these common sense issues, and that's probably how he would frame it, and most people would frame it, are things that will actually get the moderates to flip back over to the red side. Maybe you even get some Democrats who really care about the educational system and they want to make sure that they have a say in what happens in their child's education. Maybe it will even flip some of them. But you still have other issues like abortion, which will reign very true. And Youngkin does address this at, at one point in the article, saying that a 15-week ban is reasonable, and he thinks that most people would actually be completely okay with it. So taking that issue off the table is something that Republicans are definitely going to have to do going into 2024, because Democrats are going to run on it extremely, extremely hard. I mean, if you look at Andy Bashir in Kentucky right now, he is hammering home the abortion issue, because Daniel Cameron is a person who takes a very principled stance on the issue, saying there shouldn't be any exceptions. So if you can take that issue off the table, if you can either be moderate on it and be willing to say that you're just willing to do a 15-week ban, or even just not bring it up, which is going to be impossible because Democrats, they're going to run on it again. But if you can somehow get that issue off the table, if you can somehow appeal to every moderate on that issue specifically, then you can actually run a very productive campaign on some of these other issues that Glenn Glenn Youngkin has pushed really, really hard in Virginia and has served him and the Republican Party there 
pretty darn well. But it is, it really does come down to getting abortion off of the ballot. If abortion is on the ballot, more than likely the moderates and most Democrats will be calcified in their position and they will come out for the Democratic candidate rather than the Republican. That, that's my guess. That's my guess. I don't know for sure, and there are different subsets of the population and a whole bunch of different states who believe differently, but it holds true in Virginia. In other blue states, it probably holds to, uh, sorry, purple states and slightly leaning blue states, it probably holds even more true. So if you can be strategic about it, like Yunkin, and try to get it off the board as quickly as possible, maybe it will work out for the Republican Party going into 2024. Just keep your eye out for Tuesday because there's also an election going on in Mississippi, in Louisiana, New Jersey for the legislators. And then there's also a governor's race in Mississippi and in Kentucky. So keep your eye out. It will be a very interesting day. You'll see some polls coming in. It's an off-year election, so most people don't care. But still, it may have some uh, very clear ramifications going forward. So let's jump to our daily delight that comes from Woo Globe. Cute dogs have best friends reunited when their owners take them out for a walk. So, you know, everybody has that one best friend that they, they can't live without. They can't at least see or talk to every once in a while. Quote, in this heartwarming video, two cute dog best friends are reunited during a walk with their owners when they stop each other from, see each other from across the street and their excitement knows no bounds. And, you know, honestly, humans, watching human best friends get back together is always an entertaining thing. But it's even more fun when it's two dogs who have, a, you know, they're a bundle of energy and they're just ecstatic when they see their best friend. Quote, they joyfully rush towards each other, tails wagging and engaging in playful antics, including a friendly tackle. The sweet doggo reunion showcases the pure and unconditional love that dogs share, reminding us of the joy and warmth that our furry friends bring into our lives. End quote. And if you want to see any of the cute photos or videos from this article or read any of today's articles, there'll be a link in the description below that like and subscribe button where you can also find the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcasts, Podvine, as well as the Twitter handle at Your Daily Flip where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday. With all that said, there is only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.